Welcome to the Daughters Project Podcast. We're so glad you're here. Join us this season as we get to know some of our sisters, as well as women from all walks of life, as they gather around the mics every week. You can find out more about our work at thedaughtersproject.com and on social media at Daughter St. Paul. Enjoy today's episode. everyone and welcome to today's episode of the Daughters Project podcast. I am Sister Benedicta and I'm Sister Tracy and we are super excited for the conversation that we have lined up for today. We're continuing on in our series on womanhood and it's just proving to be a really beautiful and really blessed series of conversations. This has been so fun and it's been really neat for me to like sit around and pray with these topics before mm-hmm. coming to these and mm-hmm. and even after too. This has been yeah just a real blessing for me in my life. So I'm Mm -hmm. hoping that everyone else is also enjoying it. Yeah. Yeah. We all have women in our lives, so it's always good to, um, to delve in. (laughs) And I think the themes that we're talking about, they, they cross every experience of being human. So as much as it Mm -hmm. is from our experience, from the feminine perspective, I think there's a lot of light that can be shed for everyone. Amen. Amen. Speaking of light being shed on some of our feminine experience of life, Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You uh, found something particularly humorous. Oh yeah, this weekend, well, sister. Yes, we always um, try to start out the podcast with things that we overhear in the convent, um, overheard in the convent. And um, recently, uh, there was you know everybody was probably watching the Super Bowl, and the daughters of St. Paul have for a while been tweeting Super Bowl in the convent. So it's hashtag Super Bowl in the convent, and uh, usually. You know, there's some real doozies that sisters say during the course of watching the game. Like, you know, everybody has their own level of cultural awareness and some things are like, you know, completely (laughs) new to them and they've never seen or heard or whatever. And others are really, really hip and they get it, you know. And um, so if you all remember, uh, the the halftime show was going to be The weekend who was going to perform. And so one of the sisters, it, you know, it was probably late in the first or second, first quarter. And she says, oh, you know, I can't wait for the weekend. And one of the other sisters pipes up, looks at her and is like, the weekend, honey, is over. Meaning like, <laughs> we're already Sunday night. I don't know what you're waiting for. <laughs> so and she's like, no, no, this no, show. no. We're talking about the halftime show. It's the performer. Oh, oh, okay. Yeah. So so that was one thing that went out on the on our, on the interwebs with our hashtag um Super Bowl in the convent. But I know Sister Benedicta, you've also had some Super Bowl over here, overhearing, overheard oh, things. Yeah. So I actually I really enjoy watching football on a pretty regular basis. Mm-hmm. And so often I end up being one of the sisters in the room that's like explaining the game to others. Yeah. And this was this was not this year, it was a couple of years ago. I was living with a sister um, who was just very free with her commentary and is just uh, she's she's a lot of fun to be around. And uh, she was asking, they said something about a Hail Mary pass. And she said, why do they call it that? Why do they call it a Hail Mary? And I said, well, sister, it's it's when they when they have to throw a pass and it's got to be really long. And she goes, wow, yeah, it must be really long if you could say the whole thing. (laughs) That's such a nun thing, right? (laughs) <laughs> and we I say was, it slow. I was, Hail Mary. <laughs> oh, uh, I can imagine. That's right. <laughs> Where did they throw the ball? Mm-hmm. In the, the next city. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, it's always it's always kind of fun uh, bringing people in for their one game of the year for that stuff. So Yeah, yeah. It's good times. It's good times. Well, today we have with us, I'm so excited about this. This is so fun. Mm. We have Justina Kopp coming in from the Twin Cities in Minnesota. Good morning, Justina. Good morning. Welcome. We're so excited to have you with us today. Thank you for having me. Yeah. I've been really reflecting with the the letter that you wrote for the book, A Place to Belong, mm. that we've been kind of basing this whole series on. And oh my goodness, I was just like so moved by your story. Mm-hmm. Could you just share like maybe a couple of nuggets of like, not necessarily your letter, but who you are, kind of your background a little bit, uh, your family, that sort of thing? Yeah. Um, so like you said, I'm in the Twin Cities. Um, I grew up here um, in a suburb of St. Paul and now I'm in a suburb of Minneapolis. Um, I got married 
five-ish years ago uh, to my husband, Matthew. Um, we met through the Catholic Studies program at the University of St. Thomas. Even though we grew up like 45 minutes from each other, uh, we met in Rome. Uh, oh, wow. The Rome program. So, of course, I was dating someone else when we were over there, mm. unfortunately. So, <laughs> so when we got married, we uh, honeymooned back over there. So um, Italy has a very special place in our hearts. Mm-hmm. But um, the thing that people might know me best for is that I hilariously, in our first year of marriage, got pregnant with quadruplets, who are now uh, four years old. Um, I have one girl and three boys. Um, and we also have a quarantine pup, uh, Millie, the Bernadoodle, who is oh. one. <laughs> oh, That's a That's, nice I rounded got, like, family. Yeah. Amen. Very Amen. Calm, I got like one paragraph into your letter and I was like, quadruplets. I was like, okay, go on Instagram. I was like, I'll read this later. <laughs> I'm going on Instagram. I got to go see the picture. I know. <laughs> I know. <laughs> they are so cute. Wow. Oh my gosh. <laughs> They're hilarious. There's, it's, I mean, upstairs right now is pure chaos. My husband's got it under control though. And he's like, seriously, out of all the people in the world who could end up with quadruplets as a, as a father, he is, he is the perfect one because he is so patient and he is so, so gentle and loving with them. So mm-hmm. I feel very, very blessed to have not only the kids, but to have him as my, as my partner and all of it. Mm. I always think about um, how life, you know, there are things that you can like study for, prepare for, get ready for, you know, and you can kind of foresee like, okay, I need to strategize about this, or I need to do this to get ready for this thing. And as I was thinking about your story, and, and I just thought, man, you don't prepare for that quadruplets. Yeah, we were first time parents, you know, Mm -hmm. like we didn't know what it was like to have one, one child baby, right like <laughs> you're preparing in a very sort of abstract way like yeah sure you're buying a car seat or buying cribs or whatever but it's still very abstract because what does that mean everyone's like whoa that's crazy like good luck as they're like slowly backing yeah. away <laughs> see, you, see you later <laughs> like I gotta get out of here before she ropes me <laughs> and I have no idea like we're just laughing because we have no idea what any of this means. Mm, mm, I think mm. that's really what saved us. Was, wow. Was being so naive because I am a very anxious person. I am someone who thinks about worst case scenarios all the time. Mm. For me, this was a, a, like an exercise in hope, like, okay, like hope this works out. Um, and what that meant. And, but I mean, I think it helped that we had no idea what a sleepless night really was. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what, I mean, if you could sum it up, like, you know, that whole experience of like, you know, there are things that we, we try to prepare for mm-hmm. and you find yourself kind of in a situation now and it, you, you yeah. just, you're just there. Like yeah. what, w- what has that evoked out of you? What has it brought forth from you that maybe you didn't know you were capable of? Well, I'm someone that like the improbable happens to like, mm. st- statistically, like there are things that have happened to me that just don't happen. Um, my dad, uh, died in a bridge collapse. Like Mm. that doesn't bridges don't fall or they shouldn't at least. Mm -hmm. And so, so that happens to my family. Mm -hmm. Um, there's like been lots of like, there've been lots of positive things. Like a a man from South Dakota ends up in Kenya and meets my mom and boom, here we are. Um, it's, that was an improbable thing. Mm. Uh, but then like having quadruplets, like that's an improbable thing. Mm-hmm. So it's, it was, mm. I have spent so much of my adult life here, like digesting, like, what does that even mean? You know, and how it, you can't prepare for that, mm-hmm. you know, cause mm-hmm. I can't sit here and like, okay, well the improbable happens to me. So I'm probably gonna you know, get in a car accident, you know, uh, something's going to fall from the sky and crush my house. Like mm-hmm. I can't live my life that way. Yeah. So it was a situation where I had to be sort of realistic about like the risks involved with like quadruplets, like mm-hmm. your chances of, of miscarriage or um, infant loss are very high. The risks mm-hmm. to me were very high, um, but I couldn't, I couldn't live there. Like I couldn't mm-hmm. live in the worst case scenario because I had weeks of this, mm-hmm. you know, and the stress wasn't good for me and the stress wasn't good for them. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had to really dig 
deep and find like what is peace and what is hope and what does that mean when we say that we're that we're like resting in hope you know that we are even when we're scared like we're reaching that arm out and like trusting that God's going to be right there like no matter where we're reaching that like God's hand is going to be right there to catch Mm -hmm. to catch us Mm -hmm. um and I am I am terrible at that Mm -hmm. um I'm very very bad at that and so because I, because I'm a firstborn child, I am a control freak. I, like, <laughs> I am the daughter of an immigrant. Like things have to be done a certain way mm-hmm. properly. Mm-hmm. So I, you know, I try to control these situations and my whole life has been a series of really gentle lessons from God saying like, actually my child, <laughs> that is not how this goes. Wow. <laughs> so yeah. he gave the control freak uh, four babies at one time. <laughs> <laughs> he likes to do that kind of stuff, doesn't yeah. he? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh and they turned like babies was fine. Like that was really that was fine because they came home from the hospital on a schedule. They, you know, were eating every three hours and they're preemies, so they slept all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, it was it was chaotic and you're still like waking up at all hours of the night, but they were all doing the same thing at the same time. Now they're four years old. They don't do that. They don't schedule their, <laughs> their stuff don't. together for you. <laughs> oh, <laughs> Come on. It doesn't take much imagination for us to feel that the chaos part of it, you know, the part that kind of is like, ooh, what next? Um, But it also, as you were sharing, it sounds like you have a a foundation of faith in your life. Can you talk about, I mean, was that always so for you? Were you always sort of ready to kind of see how God was part of everything? Or is that something that kind of grew as you grew? Well, I grew up in a very devout Catholic home. Mm-hmm. Um, my my dad went over to Kenya as a uh, missionary to serve on a Kenyan mission, a ca- Catholic mission mm-hmm. in Kenya, mm-hmm. in a very rural, remote part of Kenya. And um, my mom grew up in a Catholic family too. And so uh, the two of them together, like, had this very like mission oriented um love for for the church and for for christ and for people mm-hmm. and so i feel like they they laid this like a uh, spirit of generosity within me that mm-hmm. like our faith is we're meant to be going out and seeking out people who need us you know like what is my role here like i like the the go out you know the go out and like proclaim the gospel or or to, to help the least of these, like Matthew 25, like to go out into the world. Like that was, that was like my whole childhood was that. Mm -hmm. And then when my dad died, when I was 16, like he died trying to save somebody. So like he lived that to the last. So then now as an, as an adult, you know, as a, as a wife and a mother, Mm -hmm. having that as my foundation, I, I feel like it was the it was like the right soil for this sort of situation to happen in. Like, obviously people have quadruplets and they don't have this background and they do just fine. But I feel like for me and my husband, that this was like, this was the the best way for us to do it was to, to, um, to have sort of a mission heart towards it to be like, okay, well, they're individuals and to raise them as individuals, not just the quads, just lump them all together. No, they, they are Cora and Raphael and Theodore and Benedict, and they're all different. You know, yes, they're born at the same time, but they're all very different individuals, just like you and your siblings mm-hmm. are all very different. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so it just, <laughs> yes. We're all giggling. We're like, oh man, talk about different. <laughs> there ain't no other nuns in my family. <laughs> 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 but you you know what I mean mm-hmm. like yeah that yeah. I feel like that having that attitude as a mother has really helped me that like you know when I lose when I lose it on a kid when I'm like very impatient mm-hmm. with them I'm like oh shoot like well that was my opportunity to love Jesus like gotta get back in there like you gotta try it again and mm-hmm. go say sorry and mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. Um, but that's it, right? Isn't it like the just the getting back in and the starting yeah, over and yeah. the, you know, and, and I was thinking of what you were saying and like kind of how that naivety that we kind of can enter into things, especially as women who are driven and like have a desire to like go do something and like do whatever it is that we're doing, but like all the way. Mm-hmm. 
sometimes it's that naivety that kind of allows for that. Because if we yeah. really knew what it was going to take to do something, I think a lot of times we would back away from it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I it think we have to, yeah, we have to ignore, sort of ignore like, okay, like the odds are stacked against me, but I don't care. Like, this is what I've been called to do and I, I have to do it. So mm-hmm. it's beautiful. It's yeah. neat how, um, there's so much about your experience, it seems, in in what you've shared that kind of set you up for, as you were sharing, you know, this, this re- ability to be open to what comes. And, um, and part of the, the, the topic that you, that you actually write about in the book is that idea of, of being able to nurture. And, um, mm-hmm. as I was thinking about, uh, nurturing for my own, you know, from my own reading and my own experience as a woman, um, I found that the way you talked about it, uh, especially that there's a certain point where you even kind of define it. Um, yeah. And I think both Sister Benedicta and I were struck by that. I don't know, Sister Benedicta, I'm not as good as you, but do you have that quote close to you? I, I do. I <laughs> like highlighted I and circled it. it. <laughs> okay. Could you share that? Because it's so, it's so rich. Yeah. Yeah, you say, um, there I learned that to nurture means to invest, to cultivate, to draw out, and to raise up each person's worth and dignity with great care and love. Ooh, wow. You wrote that. <laughs> I you, know, wrote that. you wrote that. <laughs> and, and you don't, you I mean, that. the thing is, it's like, you know, you I can read something like that from like John Paul II. Mm-hmm. And it's powerful mm-hmm. and it, it draws mm-hmm. out something in me. Like, I'm like, oh, that's part of me being a woman. And but when you wrote it, it's like after you've shared your experience, I thought, man, just for you to talk about some of those, those things, like how did you learn that it's about cultivating? It's about drawing out. It's about investing. Well, so I have had the great privilege of being able to spend like lengthy amounts of time in Kenya and, um, getting to know my family and getting to know my culture over there Mm -hmm. and everything moves at a slower pace. Everything is much less frantic than it is here. And, um, they don't glorify being busy over there, Mm -hmm. which I'm also half German. That can be very frustrating where I'm like, where is your sense of urgency? (laughs) Um, but it's really good. It's really, really good, um, to like learn to slow down, but then you, you, you're not distracted. So you see, you know, what would be like a sort of normal scene here, like a a mother tending to a, a child, like, you know, like in a Starbucks parking lot or something like, you know, tending to their kid, but there's none of the franticness of like the fact that it's a parking lot or that there's stores everywhere or that you have all these things to do. You're, you're just watching this scene happen. And like, instead of it being in a Starbucks parking lot, it's in a field and you're watching a mother like get down and like look at her child and like tend Mm -hmm. and take care. Um, And the, the ability there to just focus on just that, gosh, it, I haven't had anything really like that. besides like the pandemic has sort of forced that Mm -hmm. on me, Mm -hmm. but like, I've had to learn how to do that here um, without all the, dis- I don't have all my distractions anymore. Like I can't just run off to the zoo or the children's museum or whatever. Mm-hmm. When we were trying to come up with names and whatnot for the kids, mm-hmm. like I, I wanted the, the names to sort of to go together, but I didn't want them to like be matchy or anything. Like all of them to start with the same letter or mm-hmm. something like that. Mm-hmm. Um, I didn't, re- I wanted the theme to be that they were just names, you know, that just, yeah sort of came from the same era and whatever, but nothing, nothing more than that really. Um, Obviously they're all very Catholic (laughs) names, but that was part of the extent of the theme. Mm -hmm. But that was because I was like, I'm going to treat, these kids were acting as individuals within me and acted very differently from one another within me. And I was very, very aware of that and had names for this particular child this child's name is Benedict and this particular boy who's really calm and is, was the biggest one, like this one is Raphael. Like I knew mm-hmm. that. Um, but that was cause I sat there and I, I just focused on like the tiny world that was growing within me and, mm-hmm. and paid attention to like whatever they're communicating. Babies are very good communicators. And 
Um, they're always telling you what they want. It's just like, we don't, we're not good at listening and we're not good at paying attention to it. So it's just slow down and to, to listen to whatever they're saying and to like draw that out to be like, okay, you're, you're a smart little one too. Like, yes, you can't read or talk or whatever, but you can tell me what you need. Mm. Um, and to just, I don't know, like, I think that's, that's one of the things about, about mothering is that like, it does force us to slow down. You can't make a kid grow up any faster than, mm. I mean, if you are making them grow up any faster, that's just trauma. Mm -hmm. <laughs> just trauma Amen, girl. So like, yeah. To slow them down and to let them, let them be four years old, as much as I'd love for them to be 24 years old and taking care <laughs> of themselves, mm -hmm. they are not. And I, I have to go through each and every little step with them and, um, and to take the time to pay attention to what each kid likes to do and what each kid like enjoys or doesn't like or whatever their particular struggles might be. Like if they can't do this one thing, like to spend extra time doing that thing with them or if this kid's really obsessed with trucks. Okay, we're going to go all in on trucks for this kid. Mm -hmm. I, I think that's one of the cool things about having quadruplets is that yes, they're all like doing the same thing, but they all do it very differently. Mm -hmm. And I think that in my nurturing that I have, I've just learned, like, they're always teaching me. Like my mom always said that about me. She was like, you were my first teacher. And I was like, what are you talking about? Mm. That's ridiculous. Yeah. <laughs> but now I'm now as a mother, I'm like, Oh, I get it. Yeah. <laughs> like I absolutely mm. get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, because they're also in a way like cultivating and drawing out of me, mm. um, my own, my own femininity, my own mothering, like I'm learning how to do that because of them. Yeah. That like this sort of like this mutually beneficial thing, even though like I can't, shouldn't depend on a kid to do that. But like, it's <laughs> really cool the things that have come out of, out of this journey um, from them. And I think that happens in spiritual motherhood too. I think Sister Tracy and I both have often told stories of times when we thought we were going to do mission and then we were mission too, uh -huh. you know, we're like the person a person from the crowd or someone comes and just like speaks truth in a way that you were super not expecting and you thought you were there to give them something but in fact you walked away with a greater gift than you could have than you could have imagined you know and i think god just works that way sometimes yeah um yeah i, I think that that's that that's really beautiful and the other thing that i really loved too about your reflection justina was the emphasis on this is my body given for you you know and like looking at Jesus in, in the Eucharist and in hearing him say that, and then all the ways you in particular as a mother and particularly as, as a mother carrying four of her children at once, you know, like, yeah, that's a really profound reflection and a profound way of looking at that, at that passage. And I was thinking too, like, but that's true really of all women, right? Mm -hmm. Like that there's, I think there's a reason why so many women have such a fraught relationship with their bodies I think is in some way because we are called to we're called to reflect the the mothering characters of God and that when that gets kind of twisted up and bound up with with things in our life that that don't um, reflect that as well we end up really kind of in conflict with that and mm -hmm. I, I think we see that a lot in our society and I think I think as women, we probably all can like just relate to that phrase fraught relationship with our body, but like in a totally mm -hmm. different way, like mm -hmm. each person's going to hear that differently. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. And I just kind of was I was really reflecting with that. And like if if there's that much conflict with it, it's probably because there's something there that some enemy doesn't want showing, you mm -hmm. know, and that God does. He really wants to pull it out. And often it's like in that really uncomfortable way that God yeah. pulls things out, you know, that like. I really don't want to get up this morning, God, but this is my body given for you. I'm going to get out of bed, you know, mm -hmm. like in all these little ways that that can happen. Yeah. And it's such a, as women, like a lot of that is such an internal thing. Mm -hmm. Like it's not necessarily obvious to other people that you're struggling in that way. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of that is just like an internal an internal battle. But I think like conversations like this to just like sort of draw it out and shed some light on it. Like mm. you can't like dwell in a dark space anymore. And mm. yeah. Um, yeah, that it can like shine some truth on it too. Mm -hmm. Though oftentimes I think it's easy for us to try to look like things are okay because we have to show <laughs> up. 
and mm-hmm. do life, you know, um, mm-hmm. and and it's it's a big challenge to not only attend to those that are in our care, but also attend to me who's in my care (laughs) Um, because that entrustment that God has given us with the person starts with me as a person. Mm -hmm. And so there's a a mothering that happens for both or a nurturing that happens for those outside of ourselves, but not to the detriment or to the point where we completely disregard what might be speaking. Um, but it, you know, it's everything is always in a bit of a tension or a balance. Like it's not yeah. all or all or nothing. And um, and I think that what you were talking about earlier about really slowing down and listening, I think that's one of those challenges that we have as women is we'll we'll rush to the need of someone else, but rush past ourselves. Oh, yes, yes. And yeah. how how can I? round that out in a way that um, attends justly to all that's been given to me. And we haven't even talked about, you know, the outside world um, that is often waiting to see what does it look like to do justice? You know, Mm -hmm. seems like such an Mm -hmm. out there term sometimes, but you talk about, um, you know, even the experience of holding, uh, you know, even in the pregnancy, holding this these mysteries these persons and you could even tell they they were different and personally each had their own personalities and stuff but how even just physically that demand had uh, a profound openness for you or a, an ability for you to understand the words this is my body in a new way as you heard it in the in the mass yeah. and i was thinking man that's a powerful thing because, you know, when the babies are pressing up against you and you're like, I can't even sit here for five minutes without having to go to the bathroom, you know, that's hard. And, and yet what keeps you there? What keeps you going? It's so beautiful how you connected it to the Lord and his way. That was not me. Like it was, it was one of those things that just like sort of smacked me in the head Mm. during math day. As time went on, like, I think I was probably like, 15 weeks along, not very far along, Mm. but I was measuring like almost 30 weeks along. So I I had just this like profound weight on my pelvis. Mm -hmm. There's a thing that can happen in pregnancy because of all the relaxing hormone where you're like your pelvic bone right there at the front can like split open Open. a little bit pull apart and it's um very uncomfortable Mm -hmm. uh and so that just kept getting worse and worse and worse and worse so it made it really hard for me to kneel at mass and so Mm -hmm. I remember one time like I was like no I am kneeling today and then I heard that part of the Eucharistic prayer and I just oh could have been hormones but it was like one of those things where I was just like oh I get it now because my body is like here stretching and breaking and whatever for love of these guys, you know, and I don't know the same way that I know, like the person sitting next to me in the Mm -hmm. pew, you know, but Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm doing everything I can for them. And that I hadn't even seen the face of God. And yet he did this for Mm -hmm. me. And here I was doing, Mm -hmm. you know, a much on a much smaller scale doing this for my own children. Yeah. I think one of the things that that draws out for me too, like even as you're saying like it might have been hormones, but I had this reaction to it. Like I think for women, like we show forth the eminence of God, right? Like his his incredible presence. And so it makes perfect sense that, yeah, like we also would experience him eminently. Mm -hmm. And like the fact that like sometimes and our hormones change a lot more than men's even when we're not pregnant, right? So Mm -hmm. like sometimes God uses the fact that I'm feeling emotionally vulnerable today to like break through and and to let that become a moment of intimacy with him that we might not otherwise be able to have. And I think that's a really beautiful way, actually, that God interacts with women. Oh, yeah. um, and and I think that it's so cool that you're able to kind of pull that out in like a really explicit way. And like, like, you know, like all you're very aware of all of the things happening in your body. And I think so often we're not. And you were talking to about the intelligence of children. Mm -hmm. They know when they need to eat and they know when they are tired. And sometimes we're like, why am I so cranky? Oh, my gosh. Oh, I'm hangry. Mm -hmm. I did not realize I am hangry, right? Getting into a fight. Yeah. (laughs) Yes. But a toddler is just like, cheese stick now, please. You know, like. (laughs) Climbing into the fridge. Like, yes. Yes. (laughs) 
<laughs> this is my and survival. Because they're able to <laughs> listen to what is happening within themselves because they have to out of necessity, right? And we mm-hmm. kind of learn to to shut that down. And maybe like their example helps us to become a little bit more attentive to that again because it is a gift from God, the way that our bodies work and and the way that that all of that comes together. Like it's not an accident, mm-hmm. you know. No. Or even the even the dependency like that kids have on their yes mm-hmm. yes um, that I've learned a lot about what it means to depend on God mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. as a recovering control freak to like, like <laughs> oh like I in the same way that I you know get down kneel down in front of my kids when there's something going on or pull them into my lap and be like let's take a deep breath like mm-hmm. God is trying so hard to do that with me. <laughs> Mm-hmm. And I will resist and resist the way that like a kid will resist in like a grocery store flailing on the ground. Like that's 30 year old me mm-hmm. <laughs> trying to argue with God, you know? Yeah. Or even like when they think they're getting away with something, they think you don't know. They think you don't know what they're up to, but actually yep. you're very attuned to like exactly mm-hmm. what's going like on in the other room. Just, yeah. Yep. Yep. How's it going to go? Yes. Yes. <laughs> Yeah, And I think that whole thing about love being the base of everything, like th- love mm. is the one thing that connected you to them in their otherness, but it, they were in you. But and so in a sense, it's almost like, ah, this weight is is breaking me physically, mentally, emotionally sometimes, you know, and and so it's easy to get um, anything that hurts us. We want space from it. We just, you know. Give me my space here, people, you know, but this idea that they were imminently within you and that somehow you were given the grace to stay, quote unquote, connected, listening to them. And and I think that that's the whole challenge about living as people is that everybody outside of me is not me. And it's really easy to cut off what isn't the way I think or the way I would approach things or whatever um, and not try to find points of connection so that like you're saying, you know, when they are having a time and they're, they're just like crazy, (laughs) you can get on their level and look them in the eye. And that even if they're not hearing what you're saying, they're seeing you see them. Yes. And in so many ways, that's what prayer is about for us as, as people is like, mm-hmm. can I let God come on me, my level and I can go to him where I really am and let him look mm-hmm. at me. Yeah. Mm-hmm. One thing I've learned with the kids is that I can't be in such a rush to like resolve an issue mm-hmm. like mm-hmm. that, you know, they're going to feel their feelings. Mm-hmm. And my, my job isn't to just, my job is to keep them safe. So like mm-hmm. if they're angry, like, they're allowed to be angry. It's mm-hmm. just like, what do they do with that anger? Like they're not allowed to like throw a truck at a kid's head mm-hmm. or, yeah, you know, it's a good idea <laughs> or, or hit somebody, you yeah. know, like, they're, mm-hmm. like yeah, the teeth, teeth are not for biting. Mm-hmm. Like they have to, you know, I have to still raise like responsible. Yeah. Humans, yeah, you know? sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't want one of the things that I, I think as a, as a, as a girl and as a woman, like one of the things that was really tough was like, I am a very, outwardly emotional person. Like I am not known for holding things within me. Like I am not good at hiding how I feel about something. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and um I spent a lot of my life like having people tell me like, okay, you can't be like that. Like you can't act like that or your emotions are bad or you're weak because mm-hmm. or like as a woman, like there was uh like lots of conversations around like being mysterious and whatever. And I'm like I I, there were so many conversations I had with my husband where I was like, I'm so sorry. I'm not more mysterious. And he not like, too up, mysterious. <laughs> and he's and he probably was, like, thank God. I know. He's like, you don't need to be mysterious. No mistake here, please. But like, I don't know. Maybe it was just like the, the friend group I had where there was a lot of, I had a lot of somehow introverted friends and they just read as very mysterious to me. <laughs> Um, That's really cute. and I was like, oh, why am I not more like that? But mm-hmm. like to be like, okay, God made me this way. Yeah. And that's, mm-hmm. that's, mm-hmm. and that is good. Mm-hmm. The end, like, mm-hmm. and to then cultivate in my children, like your emotions are good. God gave you those. Those mm-hmm. are, those are very important. They make you who you are and they help you communicate things. 
um, and help you navigate the world. I'd rather you have too many emotions than not any at all. Like I'd, I'd rather that, um, but to, to let them, let them sit in that. So like, so that they're not suppressing. Yeah. <laughs> feeling validated like I want them to to know like okay well if if Theodore takes your toy like yeah that is really sad like I'm that is sad you're right and like I shouldn't be like rushing to like make it all right to be like yeah that is sad and like what can we do about it and to like let them learn how to like handle Mm, that that's so good because who's with them all the time not you (laughs) they are (laughs) you know Um, wherever you go, there you are. (laughs) So it's like, we all have that challenge of like how to navigate our own life. And we grow in that capacity. Um, Especially when we have people around us that can almost like point us back to ourselves. And also to, to the possibility that you know, this will not be forever, or there is hope that you can resolve this, or maybe you just have to live in an uncomfortable place for a little while. And guess what? You might not die. Mm -hmm. Or, or, and me seeing you go through that is actually a huge blessing for me. Thank you for letting me be part of it. You know, I think that's something we can do for each other as women too. Mm -hmm. I know that's something that my sisters do for me is like, I'll come to them and say, you know, I was really crabby the other day and I am so sorry about the way that I interacted in that meeting and the way that they'll respond. It's so beautiful, you know, and you're talking about reacting to your children that way Mm -hmm. and we can react to each other that way. And like that's a gift of God. Right. And that's like part of how he looks at us, too, Mm -hmm. is with a compassion that we often don't show ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, And I think that's part of the nurturing and that's part of the tenderness that you speak of and part of the power in tenderness that you speak of, too. That is that is so beautiful. Well, this is gorgeous, and I would love to talk forever and ever, but <laughs> I think maybe we ought to wrap up with a little prayer. Does that sound good? That sounds great. Uh, so this is a prayer to Our Lady of the Annunciation that's found in our um, the prayer book of, of the Pauline family. So we'll just pray this together. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. May all generations proclaim you, Blessed Mary. You believed the archangel Gabriel, and in you were fulfilled all the great things that he had announced to you. My soul and my entire being praise you, Mary. You believed totally in the incarnation of the Son of God in your virginal womb, and you became the mother of God. Then the happiest day in the history of the world dawned. Humanity received the divine master, the sole eternal priest, the victim who would make reparation the universal king. Faith is a gift of God and the root of every good. Mary, obtain for us, too, a lively, firm, and active faith, faith which saves and produces saints, faith in the church, in the gospel, in eternal life. May we meditate on the words of your blessed Son as you preserve them in your heart and devoutly meditated on them. May the gospel be preached to everyone. May all men and women become in Jesus Christ, children of God. Amen. Amen. In the name of the Father, and the Son, Son and the, the Holy Spirit. Spirit. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much, Justina, for being with us today. Thank you for having me. This is awesome. It really was great. Your story, I think, is going to touch a lot of hearts and just open open up some doors that maybe people didn't even know they had closed. It's going to be good. I think so, too. Mm-hmm. I think so, too. Do you want to share your social media handle so people can can find you? Yeah, you can find me best on Instagram at Justina Cop. That's okay. the, best, the best way. I bet Highly you there's a few pictures follow. of some cute little kids on there. I may entice you. <laughs> they are quite gorgeous. Yes. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much, Justina. And thank you to all of our listeners for joining us on today's episode of the Daughters Project podcast. God bless you, and we'll see you again next week. Thank you so much for listening. This podcast is a fruit of the Daughters Project. This initiative of the Daughters of St. Paul to spread the gospel online is made possible by our generous Patreon supporters. Consider joining us in our mission by contributing to Patreon today. You can find us at thedaughtersproject.com and on social media at Daughter St. Paul. God bless you.